preaching your word, and the more we preach, the more we realize there isn't anything else worth saying in this life excepting what's in your word. Every time we, we depart from the word, even to try and tell what's in our heart, we usually end up confused because we're not always really sure what is in our heart. Sometimes we employ the mind to describe what's in our heart, and that surely is a futile endeavor there. So, Father, you know what's in our hearts this morning. That's the wonderful thing. You know where each of us are, and you know who each of us are. You know what our circumstances are this morning. You know how how we feel down inside and such a blessed rest to know this so precious to just just rest quietly with you and know that we don't have to make any big explanations to you if you understand truly we we realize more and more that our communication with you your communication with us is beyond words Love has a language that's unspoken. And love is real for your love. And this love speaks to our hearts often without words. We sense it and we know it and we rest in it. And so it is with us too, Father, that we are able to convey to you without words the love of our hearts where we really are and so good to know that we can cast all our cares upon you and know that you've made us your chief concern now Father bless this message this morning not because a man is going to teach these people anything but because this is your word that we're going to set before us we want the blessing upon our hearts to open our hearts to receive what you have to say. May our hearts be attentive and hear you. May the little man that's down inside of all of us come away being satisfied and contented and at rest. Thank you for this assembly of believers and we thank you for the body of Christ, that general assembly of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. Thank you for every brother and every sister in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you because Jesus is in them. We thank you that we can see Jesus wherever we go and find him wherever we look. And we thank you for the blessed reality of this precious Savior. May the Holy Spirit open our hearts and may he take this poor, dumb, mute and use his vocal cords and whatever else about this man that he needs to convey what's on your heart to us. And again we ask you, as we have so often, that we might come away seeing no man save Jesus only. And we'll thank you for it in his precious name and for his sake. Amen. You were in the Sunday night meeting last week. I hope you'll pardon me. I practiced on you last Sunday night. And uh, now I'm going to preach what I practiced on you last Sunday night. If you will take your Bibles and turn to the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, I'd like to read three little verses here. If you have a red letter in the New Testament, you'll find these letters are in red because they're the words of Jesus. And this is what he said. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'd like to read it once more and again remind you that these are the words of Jesus. Please don't go back in the musty past as we read this and say, well, this was 2,000 years ago and he was talking to a bunch of Jews and 
doesn't have anything to do with me and it's not relevant to where I am this morning. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, whatever that statement means. He's the Alpha and the Omega and He lives beyond the realm of time. He's the eternal Son of the living God and He's just as present in this hall this morning as He was when He stood before these Jews 2,000 years ago according to your reckoning. He's just as much alive, and his invitation has never changed. There's no dispensational problem here with his invitation. None whatever. It's for all men of all time, everywhere, because though his method of giving rest may have changed, the rest hasn't changed, and he's still the source of it. And if you would have it, you'll still have to get it from Jesus. And so I'd like to read this again with this in mind, that Jesus is here this morning in this hall, and this is his word to you. You didn't come here by accident, you know. He arranged for you to be here, and he decided ahead of time what he wanted to say to you. And this is what he wants to say to you, come. Unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. First of all, there's two kinds of people in the world, as you well know. They're not black people and white people. They're saved people and unsaved people. Now, really, they have a lot in common, and yet they don't have anything in common. What they have in common is that they're both sinners. And what they do not have in common is the grace of God. Unsaved men are sinners who are lost, who are dead in their trespasses and sins, and they're men who have no rest and never will find any rest unless they find it in Jesus. And then there's the saved man who's only a sinner, saved by grace. He's not saved because he suddenly started being good. He's not saved because he suddenly attained to some spiritual quality that the unsaved man doesn't have. The saved man is saved by the grace of God. And the only difference between the saved man and the unsaved man is the blood of God's Lamb, the Lord Jesus. If you remember back in the book of Exodus, when God gave his instructions about the Passover, he said, I'm going to show in this thing that there is a difference between the Israelites and the Egyptians. But when the death angel passed over, the only difference that could be found in all the land was the blood posted on the doorpost and the lintels. Most of those Israelites were just as lying, just as ungodly, just as conniving, just as rotten, just as wicked as the Egyptians that perished. But there was one thing that set a difference between them. It was the blood God gave by his grace to save them. And the only difference between the unsaved man and the saved man is the grace of God. That's all. God justifies the ungodly. He doesn't justify godly men because there aren't any. He justifies ungodly people. And you were just as ungodly five minutes after you were justified as you were five minutes before you were justified. Because the moment you became justified, that didn't change you from an ungodly man to a godly man. It just changed your relationship to God. And it took you out of Adam and put you in Jesus Christ where you're safe. It took you off the sin-cursed earth and put you in the ark that's been pitched with the blood of atonement. And I wish the Christian world could lay hold of that because they suddenly think if you hold up your hand, walk the aisle or sign a card, you suddenly turn into a godly man when the light falls on you at the altar. That doesn't happen. God justifies the ungodly, and that won't be good news for anybody but ungodly people. But it sure is good news for a man like me, because I'm a sinner. 
And that's the reason I'm so happy in Jesus, because I found me a Savior. And I want you to know there's only two kinds of people here this morning. You're either a sinner, lost and separated from God in your sin, or you're a sinner that's saved by the grace of God. And God has, by His grace, separated your sin and sins from you when He separated the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. Now, there's only one kind of sinners that are lost, but there's two kinds of sinners that are saved. And I hope you don't interpret this to mean that I'm trying to divide the body of Christ. I'm only commenting on the present experience of the believer. There's two kinds of sinners saved by grace. There's rested sinners saved by grace, and there's tired sinners saved by grace. You agree to that? There are those who have rest, and there are those who don't have any. So they're saved. And that may seem like a paradox to you, but I hope to be able to explain it to you as I read and tell you what Jesus has to say in this present word. I see two Gospels in this portion. The gospel for the sinner. There's also a gospel for the believer. And the gospel is only good news. And I see good news here, wonderful good news for the sinner who's lost and on his way to hell. And I see wonderful good news here for the sinner who's saved by grace and on his way to heaven. So, I mean, you can't, you can't lose for winning this morning. You're going to get good news wherever you are and whoever you are. And so the first thing of good news that I want to tell you about is the good news for the sinner. Because I trust that there's some here. Sinners, I'm talking about who are unsaved. Sinners who have never found any rest with God, let alone finding any rest within. I'm talking about a rest within with God. And if you don't have that rest, I want to tell you precisely how to have it. First of all, hear and believe what Jesus says. His first word is that royal word of the Scripture. One of the most beautiful words in the entire word of God when it comes from the mouth of God. To think that the holy God would invite the likes of you to come to him. But this is his invitation. This is his welcome. He says, come. And that means to me that he wants you to come. Don't say, but he doesn't know about me, but he does. Don't say, well, I must clean up my life and then I'll come. He knows about your life. He bids you come now, wherever you are, whoever you are, however you are. It doesn't make any difference. Come, and I get one message out of that. He wants you. When you say come to someone, you're inviting them. You're welcoming them. You're, you're opening the door of whatever it is that you have available to them. It's your invitation, and this is his. It's come. Come. And I promise you this, that if you want to come... There isn't anything or anyone that can keep you from coming. Because when Jesus says come, the very fact that he has bid you come is the enablement you need. All you have to do is believe him, that he wants you, and that you can come to him. Come just as you are. I started out preaching in the country, and they have a special kind of sin down in the county where I started preaching. I call it old-time religion because it's totally void of, of the truth of God. And every place I went and, and, and amplified the invitation of Jesus, I heard this response. Well, I'd like to come, preacher, but I've got sins in my life. I'd like to come, preacher, but I can't live the life. You ever hear that? I'd like to come, preacher, but I'm not ready because I've got a lot of things to straighten out first before I come to the Lord. 
I'd like to come, preacher, but uh, you just don't know about me. There's too many things in my life that I can't handle. And one of these days, I'm going to come. But they'll never come until they come just as they are, from wherever they are to wherever he is when they hear his voice. You've got to come, bring all your sins with you. Because when you get to Jesus, he'll show you that they're of no concern anymore. He bore them in his own body on the tree. But you say, I have a sin nature. Fine, bring it to Jesus. And when you come to him, you won't be condemned for that sin nature anymore because he'll show you that he was made your sin at the death of the cross, descended into hell for you and is raised again and is seated at the right hand of God as the written guarantee and the living proof and evidence that there's nothing between your soul and God in heaven save this one mediator who is the Lord Jesus himself. You just come. That's all you have to do. You ever get an invitation like that for a rest? Or somebody just said, Brother, just come. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be anything. You don't have to bring anything. Just come. It's you we want. We want you to come and rest. This is what Jesus is saying. You don't have to bring anything with you. And if you think there's something about you that you can't leave behind or you can't get loose from, just bring it with you. And I promise you, he'll take care of it when you get to Jesus. He wants you. Wherever you are, whoever you are, in whatever state you're in, He wants you. That means He desires you. And that means, and you knew I'd get to it, He loves you. You say, how could He ever love me? I don't know, because I can't see like He sees. But He loves you. You say, well, He couldn't love me like I am. Yes, He loves you like you are. And, and if you think that he doesn't love you like you are, then you think he loves like every other man on this earth. He loves those he likes. Oh, he loves the unlovely. He loves the ungodly. He loves the sinner, though they're not like him. He's holy and innocent and undefiled and harmless, separate from sinners, the Scripture reads, and yet he loves the sinner. He loves the sinner. They're precious to him. So precious that he'd leave ninety and nine who said they had no need of repentance. He left them in the wilderness. And he went out alone and searched until he found that one lost sheep. He loves the sinner. Always has he loved them from the foundation of the world. And he wants you to come. That's his word of invitation. Just come. But you have to understand now, brethren, what he says. When he says, come unto me. And oh, I do believe that there are many people in this world, and maybe some of you, I don't know. You've heard the invitation. You've felt a need to come. You've felt the desire to come. You maybe even have conjured up or mustered up the courage to come. But when you came, you either came to the assembly, or you came to a man, or you came to a creed, or you came to a doctrine, or you came to an understanding of some spiritual truth, or you've come someplace else besides ever coming to Jesus. And I know that I probably get very repetitious and very boring sometimes when I preach, but I have to stay elementary. And here's where I stay. Jesus is a real person. And when you come, you have to come to him. And coming to the church is not the same as coming to Jesus. And coming to a doctrine is not the same as coming to him. And coming to a man is not the same as coming to him. Coming to Jesus is something entirely different. Come to me. I know many people who felt the need to come, who didn't have any rest and who wanted that rest and who tried to find that rest by coming to church. <coughs> And they said, I'm going to come to church and then I'll find rest. But the only thing they found when they got there was that they were tireder than they were when they got there. More weary when they left than they were when they arrived. Do you know why? 
for because while they were there they had other burdens heaped on them that made their load heavier than ever before. Jesus says, come to me. You come to me, brethren. I'll give you rest. And I never knew of a man, woman, boy, or girl in 2,000 years who ever did this in his heart who didn't come away with rest. He got the rest he wanted because Jesus gave it to him. But you've got to come to Jesus to get it now. And I hope that makes an impression upon you that coming to Jesus and coming to church aren't one and the same. And the reason I keep amplifying that is because I was raised with the idea that the church organization or the church building or the church program was synonymous with Jesus. I was raised with the idea that I couldn't come to Jesus unless I came to church. I was raised with the idea they were one and the same. To turn away from the church was to turn away from Jesus. To come to church was to come to Jesus. And hey, you know, had it not been for the grace of God, I might have died believing that. But I thank God that I know the difference this morning. Jesus is a real person. He don't have anything to do with buildings, and he don't have anything to do with organizations. He's not confined inside the little perimeter of somebody's creed. He's not locked up in somebody's tight theological system. Nobody has him in any sheepfold out there, and I can't have him unless I get in that fold. Jesus is in this hall this morning, and he's walking the streets of this city this morning. He's in your home every day. He rubs elbows with you every moment of your life on your job. He's searching for you. He's looking for you. He's calling for you. Wherever you go, his voice is ringing, even in the stars at night and in the work of his hands around you. And the voice just says one word, and it says, Come. It says, Come. And the heart hears it. I know the heart hears it. But the heart is so often misdirected in the unsaved, and so often the heart is prostituted in the unsaved, and so often it's corrupted and spoiled in the unsaved by men who direct them to something else besides Jesus. I've watched it in the clergy. They have the incurable habit and, to me, the unpardonable sin of wanting men to turn to them instead of to Jesus. And, oh, it's hard for them to, to cut them loose and turn them to Jesus for fear, you see, that they as men won't have any influence over them anymore and won't have any control over them anymore. And, oh, I beg of you this morning, this invitation is from Jesus and it's for you to go to him in a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You don't have anything to do with me. They don't have anything to do with this hall. They don't have anything to do with the assembly. It doesn't have anything to do with the program we're carrying out. It doesn't have anything to do with the tapes. It doesn't have anything to do with the book room. It doesn't have anything to do with our gathering together from time to time as a group of saints. This is Jesus, and he wants you to come to him. If you're unsaved, here's where you need to come is to Jesus. He's a real person who invites you. But his invitation, far from being inclusive of all, is an exclusive invitation because he defines and characterizes those who may come. Only certain ones are permitted to come. Only certain ones can come. He speaks only to certain ones. This is the reason why some never hear him. Because they're not included in this invitation. Sounds like a contradiction. He said, come unto me all. Oh, but he defined that all. He said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Those are the ones I'm inviting. No one else can come. The well have no need of a physician, he said. I'm here for the tired. I'm here for the weary. I'm here for those who have labored to the point of exhaustion, who are fatigued in their souls until they can't go anymore. I'm here for those who've been heavy laden and can't move under the load that's on their souls. That's what I came for, and those are the ones I came to seek and to save, the lost. Did he not say that? The man doesn't know he's lost until he has labored to the point of spiritual exhaustion 
in his struggle until he has been so heavy laden that he cannot carry the burden that is upon him. When he lays down and quits and says, I can't go any more, any further, here I die. Save me, Lord, lest I perish. That's the man Jesus came to save, and that's when he hears this royal word in his heart, come. And you know, Jesus is not like me, or I'm not like him. I wish I were, but I'm not in this respect. I never like to be a last choice in anybody's life, do you? I don't like to be the last resort. It, it kind of puts me down when somebody says, well, I went to everybody else first, and you're the last chance I got. I'm coming to you as a last resort. It always kind of puts me down, but Jesus is always the last resort. And doesn't that speak of his meekness and his lowliness of heart? He's willing to be the last resort in your life if you just come to him. He's willing to wait until you've gone to every man that you can go to and you can't find the rest you need. He's willing to wait until you've gone to all of the ways that man has invented for you to find rest and found out they're all lies. He's willing to wait until there's no one left but him. And he'll never say, well, I don't know now whether I want you or not. You turned me down the first time around. Anytime any human being, any place on this earth can hear Jesus in his heart say, come to him, he can come. Now, it may sound like a loaded statement, but that's a true statement. He'll wait for you. He'll wait while you try. If you want to save yourself, he'll wait. He waited at the temple, didn't it? When the father's house was filled with thieves, didn't he wait? Oh, yes, he did. He sat down and patiently made himself a scourge. It took him a long time to do it, but he waited. When the time came, he used it. He'll wait, too, in his love. He'll wait for you in your spiritual arrogancy, in your spiritual pride, in your self-righteousness. He'll wait while you go out there and try to save yourself. He'll wait while you join a church. He'll wait while you get baptized and sing in the choir and go through the silliness of religion. He'll wait for that one moment when you lay down at night and you close your eyes and there's no rest in your soul and you know that all the efforts you've made have still denied you the one thing you want and that's peace with God and rest in your soul. He'll wait until that moment comes and then he'll say once more, come to me, come to me. It's still like I told you in the beginning. I'll give it to you. You won't have to earn it. You want to work for it? In fact, you can quit your work and, and just rest. You can just rest. That's what you want. Come to me. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Isn't that strange how hard it is to give anything to anybody? Isn't that strange that the nature of man is so warped and twisted and perverted that you can't give him the unspeakable gift of God until he's worn himself plumb out until he wants that rest so badly that he's willing to face the humiliation of saying, Lord, I guess I'll just have to take it as a gift. I can't get it any other way. That's the way every one of you got saved who are saved this morning. Don't you ever tell me that you started right out saying, I know salvation is by grace and I know I can't do anything to earn it, so I'm going to go right to the Lord. Every one of us wore ourselves out trying to save ourselves. I remember like it was yesterday that I believed until I was 23 years old that any time I wanted to be a Christian, I could be one. Do you ever believe that? I thrived on that thought in my mind. I used to go around consoling myself with it. Hey, I'm just living the way I'm living, and I just am what I am temporarily and until I get tired of it and like a little hummingbird, suck all the honey out of it. And then when I get all the joys out of life that I want, I will be a Christian by myself. I'll turn myself into Christian. Just some night, I'll just get down on my knees and tell God, forgive me all my sins. We'll start out in the morning being a Christian. And I'll get up there and I'll just, boy, I'll just be a Christian like you've never seen before. 
You ever say that to yourself? Because I really did truly think that I could live the life, quote unquote. If I wanted to, I used to say it's a matter of setting your mind to it. It's just a mind over matter. And then I found out later, as the Lord dealt with me, that the fact that I didn't have any mind didn't matter to him at all. <laughs> and you know, the, the first great spiritual shock I had in life, I went into shock, believe me. The day that I decided that I was going to have this rest from God and I was going to get it by being a Christian. And I sat down with a paper and pencil, dummy that I was, and I made a list of the things I was going to quit and I made a list of the things I was going to start. Because I thought being a Christian was just shutting off one faucet and turning on another one. Just shutting off one course in life and turning on another one. Now I'm going to change the whole direction of my life. I'm going to change the whole pattern, the whole bent, the whole will of my existence. I'm going to adapt myself to the Christian life and I'm going to find out what a Christian is supposed to be and then I'll practice being what a Christian is supposed to be. And I really tried. And it didn't take me very long to begin to feel the frustration of the inner man in not being able to get it done. And then I got mad at God. Then I finally broke down and asked God if he'd help me do it. And he wouldn't help me do it. He won't help anybody save themselves. He can't. He's committed. He's committed to a covenant he entered into with himself at the cross of Calvary. He can't help you save yourself. I kept saying, Lord, I'm doing my part. Will you do yours? And he never even answered me. And I just kept on trying. And I just kept on laboring. And I just kept on working. And I kept on struggling. And I kept on kicking and fighting and bending every effort I could until I got myself so spiritually exhausted, I said, I can't do it. And I never will be able to do it. God, help me. What am I going to do? And he said, come to me, and I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Come to me, and I'll give it to you. And I came to him. He gave it to me. Now, I've never worked sense to keep it. I've never had the work to enjoy it. I've never had to do anything but rest in the presence of God. I have peace with God. You want know to have peace? Jesus gave it to me. He is my peace. He himself is my peace. And when I got him, I got everything. He said, come to me and I'll give you rest, but you can't come until you've worn yourself out. Try it. I was talking to a woman one time who had asked me to pray for her husband. And she said, he's unsaved and I wish you'd pray the Lord would save him. Which, pardon me, and I'm not even going to explain this. I mean, you people out there in tape land just get mad if you want to, but that's a silly prayer anyway. As though God is sitting up there in his throne room sucking his thumb and sulking. And he has to be persuaded by me to save somebody. So they come to me because I'm a man of the cloth, you know. And that means to the world out there that I must have some special influence with the Lord. I was talking to a salesman the other day on the phone. He said, I know you have some influence upstairs. Don't pray any rain on me this weekend. They believe that, you know. Hey, I don't have any influence with him. But I'll tell you one thing, I know the one who does. His name is Jesus. He got some influence. And I know him and he's in me. That makes things all right. But this woman came and she said, pray for my husband. And I want to ask silly questions like, do you think if I pray for your husband, your husband will be saved? Or do you think my prayers can do what yours can't? I can only pray as the Holy Spirit burdens me. I can't utter a word unless he speaks to my heart. And then when that happens, it's not me, it's him. And he's going to do that prayer, and you can count on that. But she said, he's unsaved, and he needs to be saved. So then after a while, she came back and she said, oh, my husband's in worse shape than he was before. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, when I asked you to pray for him, he was just flat out wicked. And he just lived like the devil and he didn't care. 
And she says, now he suddenly got religious and he's quit smoking and he's quit drinking. And she said, he's far worse now than he was. And I said, no, he's in better shape. He's progressing. Now, not because he quit these things was he progressing. He's progressing because he's about to discover that he can't save himself. He's out there in Jonah's ship that's about to go down. He's throwing that stuff overboard trying to keep it afloat. And the more he throws overboard, the deeper he's going to go. And I promise you, before he gets done with this self-redemption, he will promise the depths of sin he never knew existed in his heart. I promise that because things got to get worse before they can get better. And so let me tell you something. You can't come to Jesus because he doesn't invite you until you've worn yourself out trying to save yourself and you've still never come up with the very thing that salvation is all about and it's rest. You know what that word means? It means to be relaxed. In the little man inside, it means to be at peace. It means to be refreshed. It means to be relieved of all obligation and duty and responsibility for God. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't it? Say, careful now, that may be heresy. Oh, no. Rest is to be relieved of duty. They had a little phrase in the service for it. It's called R-O-D, right? Relieved of duty. Rest and relaxation. It's to not have to fight anymore. It's not have to carry the battle anymore. It's not have to move the load anymore. It's not have to go to work anymore. It's not have to do anything anymore. That's what rest is. To cease from your labors. And that has to happen when you enter into rest. Or you're not resting. And he said, this is what I want to give you is rest. So you can quit your work. And you can get out from under the load. And I'll give it to you if you'll come to me. Now listen to this invitation, brethren. Because if you dig around in these words in the original, you come up with some real gems. When he said, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, he uses two tenses there. One is the active and one is the passive. Now listen to what this means. All ye who labor, there is the active tense. The unsaved man that Jesus invites is the man who takes it upon himself to do this thing. He initiates the action. He says, I've got to work to please God. I've got to do something to find his rest. I've got to accomplish something in the sight of God or I can't have it. And to his mind, if he does what he's supposed to do, God will give it to him as a reward for his efforts. This is an active doing. It's the man's efforts. It's the man's own personal religion his own personal struggle in his soul against God to earn from God the very thing he senses in his heart he must have. But the heavy laden passes from the active tense to the passive. That means the subject is acted upon from without. And you hear this. The unsaved man who's trying to find rest for his soul is not only the victim of his own religion, which he inflicts upon himself in an effort to find that rest, he is the victim of every other man's religion who comes down the pike. They are the ones who heavy laden him. You with me? Not only has he taken to himself the weary struggle of trying to establish his righteousness in the sight of God, but he has stood in one place long enough until every man he knows has put on him the burden of their own religion. That's the yoke they were wearing. And he asked them to trade it for his yoke. Because he said, it's easy. <laughs> and the burden of it is so light. I'm going to tell you about that in a few minutes. Oh, brethren, if your own religion don't kill you, mine will. 
Right? Okay, sinner starts out, he's going to get himself saved. He wants rest. That's what he wants. He wants rest for his soul. There is no rest, saith my God, to the wicked, but he doesn't know that. He's going to find rest for his soul. He starts out on the trek, on the quest, on the search for reality. Rest, he says, I'm going to have. And he sits down with his paper and pencil, just like I told you I did. And he decides what God expects of him to have rest. He writes down on that paper, whether he uses a literal paper or not, or writes it on a tablet of his mind. He constructs for himself a creed which he thinks will gain rest for his soul. And then he sets about to follow it, and he inflicts this painful, heavy, burdensome religion upon himself, and he tries to live the life and stand by it and do his best and establish his righteousness with God. And lo and behold, the first thing you know, when others hear about his efforts, they pounce on him like a pack of vicious hounds. And they say, you left out baptism, and you left out join the church. And you left out come to communion, you left out witnessing, you left out preaching, and you left out reading the Bible, and you left out praying, and you left out giving alms to the poor, and you left this out, and you left that out. You have to come to prayer meeting, you have to get involved in a revival, you have to take a part in the program. Back in the mountains where I started preaching, you know how they described Christians and unsaved people? It divided them in two categories, those who took a part in church and those who didn't take a part in church. You ever hear that phrase? <laughs> and let me tell you something, if you think you had a load when you were trying to live up to your own religion, you ain't seen no load until every religious Tom, Dick, and Harry in the world dumps his load on you. You see, you, you actively inflict your own religion upon yourself, but they come along and like a beast of burden. They pile load after load after load on top of you. And there'll come a time when you can't drag it any further. There'll come a time when you can't live up not only to their religion, you can't live up to your own. I got a brochure in the mail the other day and it showed a saintly young man who let his hair and his beard grow so that I assumed that he would resemble Jesus, which is blasphemy. And he wore a robe, which I'm sure he meant to resemble Jesus' robe. And you could almost see the halo over his head. And he was offering to everyone who would come and see the secret to victorious Christian living, offering to everyone who would come and hear him a fountain of river, a river of living water flowing out of him like a fountain. He had found the key to success. He was the teacher of victorious Christian living. He was the man. You want to know how to get on with it? Come and hear him. I looked at the brochure and I said to myself, Oh my, you talk about a sad day when that young man is stuck with that image. When that young man wakes up and gets honest, if he ever does, and looks down at his own poor, wretched, slimy heart and sees that not only has he never discovered the answers, he hadn't even learned what the questions are. What's a man going to do who's established his image as having arrived in holiness only to discover that he's been deceived? What will he do? Brother, you haven't tried to move a load like the load of your own religion plus the religion of every other man who comes along. And when you can't move it any further, when you can't carry it any longer, when you can't exist another moment under the load, when you're spiritually exhausted, the French word for this word, labor, is fatigue. Worn totally out. I can't carry my own religion anymore. And I'm broken down under the load that men have put upon me. You come to Jesus, and he'll take it all off of you in one moment. All of it. And brother, when he takes it all off of you, the natural result of that is that you'll end up with rest. Isn't that right? Do you know what this word rest means? 
It's made up of two words in the original language. One of them is a prefix, and it's a precious little prefix because it's a prefix that's always put in front of a word to signify intensity and repetition. Or intensity and a continuous thing. And it continues not only on and on and on and on, it gets more intense as it continues. And this is a little prefix that the Holy Spirit chose to put on the word rest. The kind of rest that Jesus gives you continues. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and it grows in intensity. As time goes on, I'm more rested now in the grace of God by far than I was 27 years ago, aren't you? I'm resting. I rest a little more every day. You know what? The grace of God is, is like ice on the river. And, and with trembling, faltering step, we tiptoed out 18 inches from the shore when we got saved and we've been afraid to put our weight down ever since. I've been putting a little weight down. And the more weight I put down, the thicker I find that ice is. The more of a reality it's in, revealed to me to be. I'm resting more today than I ever rested in my life. Hey, just the other day I was thinking back over some experiences I had in life. For years while I was preaching the grace of God, it would never, never, never have occurred to me to think that down inside of me and the little man inside, down in the soul, the heart that Jesus is talking about here, were there any ideas left that my standing with God depended on anything I did. But I want to tell you, when I missed my Bible reading, I was terrified. And when I didn't pray as long as I thought I ought to pray at night, I was terrified. You know what I'm talking about? And if I had to be away from church, or away from the meeting, or if I couldn't preach, or if I couldn't hand out a tract, or if I couldn't witness to somebody for Jesus in a day's time, I went to bed like a whipped dog night after night. Or if I seen some little ugly thing creep up in me during the day, and I forgot to confess it at night, oh boy. If something happened to my rest, it wasn't as good as it was the day before when I was walking the line and doing everything I was told I was supposed to do. You with me now? You understand that? Oh, I do believe in the grace of God. And you know what grace means? It means everything from God and it means nothing for me. Do you know what Jesus means when he said, I'll give you rest? It means you won't have to work for it anymore. You won't have to work to get it because I'll give it to you. And when I give it to you, my gifts and callings are without repentance and you'll never have it taken away from me. You. You'll have it forever. That means then that you don't have to work to get it and that means that you can't work to keep it. So you just as well relax and enjoy it. That's the message I get out of this invitation. And immediately when you say something like that about the grace of God, the religious world goes bananas, blows all their tubes out, and the board lights up tilt. And they say, the man's preaching a license to sin. Oh, we've got to do this. We have a duty. We have a responsibility. We have an obligation. God's depending upon... You know what God is depending upon you to do? Grow more ungodly day by day. He counted on that from before the foundation of the world. That's the reason he killed his son to do something about it. You think that's not scriptural? Brother, you read the sixth chapter of Genesis and see what God said when he looked over the hearts of men. He said the evil in men's heart grows continually every day. He counted on it. He said there ain't nothing going to get the job done but to wipe them out and put men under the blood. And that's what he did at the cross of Calvary. He wiped them out and he put them under the blood. And I said, I'm not counting on you for anything. I'm not dependent. Well, don't you think a Christian ought to do this and he ought to do that? I don't think a Christian ought to do anything. Because when you say he ought to do, you're using a word of obligation. You're using a word of responsibility. You're using a word of duty. I don't think a Christian ought to do anything, but I'll tell you this. If you are a Christian, you'll do things. 
But you won't do them because you ought to. You'll do them because you want to. You'll do them because you love to. You'll do them because, by golly, you can't help yourself. You'll do them because you're constrained by the love of God to do it. You'll do it because there's someone working down inside of you, driving you along in that narrow course, like I told you last Sunday morning. It's called the constraining love of Christ. Oh, you religious people, you like to twist everything that's said. You like to make it come out like you want it to come out. I'm not preaching any license to sin to you. I'm not telling you Christian doesn't ever have to do anything. I'm telling you he's never compelled to do anything. He's never made to do anything. He's never ordered to do anything. God never depended on him to do anything. You are his workmanship. Did you hear that? He's the worker. You're what he's working with. And boy, he ain't got much to work with. You're what he's working with. Don't try to do his work for him. Don't try to finish his poem, because that's the word in the Greek. You are his poem. Let him write the stanzas as he sees fit, so that in that day he will look upon you and he'll say, This is my workmanship. And all creation will say, Oh, it's beautiful, Lord. Let him do it his way. You can't do anything to keep rest. If you want rest, I'll tell you how to have it. You've got to come to Jesus and let him give it to you. Many a man thought he came to Jesus because he got to a spiritual place of trouble one time and he went to Jesus and he tried to make a deal. And he said, Lord, I'll come to you and if you'll forgive me of my sins, because he thinks that after today he ain't never going to sin again. And he said, Lord, if you'll forgive me of my sins, if you'll make things right with you, I'll serve you starting today. Or I'll give you my life. Or I'll surrender my talents to you. Or, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do from this day on if you'll give me rest. And because that proposition does sound so good to his conscience, he enjoys a momentary relief from the pressure of his conscience. And he says, i got rest, i got rest. But the next day when he gets busy and he forgets to do for God what he told him he was going to do, the trouble comes back on him and he finds out he doesn't have any rest and he never did have any. Because the only rest the unsaved religious person ever finds is when he is actively engaged in doing what he thinks God will reward with rest. Do you hear me? Hear my message? Okay. Like a cargo ship just laying there idle at the anchor. And men come and they just dump load after load after load on him. That's the word that's used here to describe those who are heavy laden. I was like a poor old cargo ship at the harbor of life, and every religionist I knew came along and dumped another hundred pounds on me. Said, do this and live, do this and live, do this and live, do this and live. Jesus said, when you get worn out, when you're about to sink, when the water's lapping over the gunnels, when you're about to go down, when, like a beast of burden, you're on your knees and one more straw will break your back. When you've carried the load you've put upon your own soul so long that you're so exhausted you can't even look toward heaven. Jesus said, come. You say, how can I come in a shape like that? Well, that's easy because he ain't someplace way off. He's as near as your heart. And when he says, come... It's just the heart reaching out of faith and saying, Lord, I give up. I give up. Save me, lest I perish. Oh, and the Holy Spirit will somehow convey the miracle of the good news of his gospel. That Christ bore all those burdens. He carried all of those sins. He suffered all of those shames. It was what broke him down at the cross of Calvary. That's what spiritually exhausted him. It's the load that was put upon him that sent his soul into the outer darkness and down into the deepest pit. He'll show you that you don't have to carry it anymore because he carried it and it's gone. And then you'll have rest. He said, praise the Lord, I haven't got any load anymore. I don't have to do anything. 
I don't have to be anything. I don't have to go any place. I don't have to say anything. I don't have any image to live up to. I'm saved. I'm at rest. That's the kind of salvation I believe in. Another word is translated, or another uh, translation or definition of this word rest is to relax or loosen strings or cords that were once drawn tight and strained. <laughs> Are you up tight? He'll loosen you up. He'll let the pressure off the strings. He'll give you rest. I was in the music world and I've heard him use that phrase. Rest the strings. Take tension off of them. Take pressure off of them. Just let them be loose. That ought to be the result of being saved, you know that? Loose. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you what? What is it? Free. Isn't that a wonderful word? That speaks of liberty. I'm free. They got a saying out here in the world, free as a bird. Birds are supposed to be free. They just go where they want to go. They're just out there being birds. <laughs> They're not worried about whether other people like their feathers or not. They're not worried about whether other people approve their nest. They're not worried about whether other birds like the kind of worms they eat. They're not worried about where they fly from day to day. They just get up in the morning. They just follow their heart. They fly. And they're free. And somehow, God feeds them and takes care of them and watches over them. Even the foolish ravens. And He takes note of even the tiniest little sparrow that falls. And we who have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, who were bought, brethren, for liberty. Study the word agorazo, the basic word in the New Testament for redeem. What does it mean? It means to buy back from captivity, to bring back from slavery and set free. That's what it means. Jesus said, come, I'll give you rest. And you can't have rest and work yourself to death at the same time. Because the two aren't compatible. You've got to rest in Jesus to be saved you've got to say he's my salvation he's my rest I'm resting in him I turn the job over to him it's only half my mercies I'm only going to give you half of them I'll give you the other half when I get back from wherever it is I'm going what kind of rest will this man have he will have Another definition is the kind of rest that a frightened and weary child has when he at last crawls up in his mother's lap and lays his weary head upon her breast and goes to sleep. Isn't that rest? What, is, what, is, what does he get out of that? Why, it's, there's nothing to worry about. Mama will take care of everything. Mama's arms are around me. Mama's here. No, oh, she's so warm and so real. She'll take care of me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to do anything about my problems. I don't have to be anything because Mama loves me. That's another definition for this word. Another definition is that it's the kind of rest a sick man has after he's reached a crisis. Were you ever really, really ill and you reached a crisis and your body was not only racked with pain but you were filled with a burning fever and you were out of your mind and you just tossed and turned and threw yourself and cried in pain and the darkness wouldn't go away. And it seemed like it was an endless night and you came to a climax of that illness where you just felt like you couldn't go on another moment. And then all of a sudden, you heard somebody say the fever broke. And the heat began to go down. The pain began to let up. And it was all over. And you fell into an exhausted sleep. And you probably slept for two or three days. What would you do? You just rested. Just rested. That's the kind of rest Jesus is talking about. A man who's trying to save himself is a sick man. He's racked with pain and he's burning with fever. And though his friends and his loved ones come and would want him to be well, 
Every drug they bring him makes him sicker. And every injection they give him increases his pain. And every endeavor they make to make him well only sinks him deeper and deeper and deeper into the sure death of his sickness. Come to Jesus. And just like he spoke to Peter's mother-in-law and immediately, the scripture says, the fever left her. Just like he did when he touched the lame man and behold, he took up his bed and walked. Just like he did when he laid his hand upon the eyes of that poor blind man coming out of Jericho and he could see. Just that very moment that you rest your soul in Jesus, turn it over to him, fall spiritually exhausted like a frightened, weary child into his arms and nestle close to his precious heart and say, Lord Jesus, give me rest. The fever will break. The pain will go away. You won't have to work anymore. You won't have to carry the load. You won't have to pick it up again and go with it. It'll be gone forever because when you put it on Jesus, he'll bury it in hell and he'll go sit down with his Father in glory to show you that it would never come back to burden you again. This kind of rest stays. I've never lost it. Never. Never have I ever got under the burden of trying to live up my religion or anybody else's to keep my standing with God. This rest stays. For you see, when you cease from labors, you enter into rest. And when you've made the one sacrifice of Hebrews 10, there remaineth no more sacrifices to make. There aren't any more. The rest is yours, and it's yours forever. I trust you have that, and if the Lord brings me back to you and we have an opportunity to be together again, I'd like to preach the other half of this gospel, the gospel for Christians. Because there's a lot of you believers who have this kind of rest I'm talking about, but who don't enjoy it. And the reason you're not enjoying it is because you're still wearing a yoke. A yoke that somebody else put on you. And Jesus said, take my yoke. You can't wear a man's yoke and enjoy this rest. You have this rest toward God. You know what I'm talking about. It's the difference between peace with God and the peace of God. You have rest with God. You know the matter of your salvation is all of grace and Jesus gives it to you as a free gift of God's love. But oh, the yoke that many of us are wearing and spoiling the enjoyment of that precious rest. We're wearing the yoke of other men's religion. We're wearing the law. You can't do it for long. it <laughs> break you down. But I'll tell you where you can find some rest in your Christian life. Make this your one desire. To learn of Him. <laughs> That's the simplest thing I know. Make it your one desire to learn of Him. And the more you learn of Him, the more rest you'll find. The more you learn of Him, the less religion you'll have and the more rest you'll find. The more you learn of Him, the more His meekness and the lowliness of your heart will get hold of yours. The more willing you'll be to be content with less than what's due you, the more relaxed you'll be because you'll quit struggling for everybody's approval and everyone else's acceptance. You'll be like that frightened and weary child You'll be so warm and cuddly and nestled down in the arms of Jesus that you just quit worrying about everybody else and everything else. you find rest for your souls. Isn't it true that there are many who have come to Jesus to be saved who have never really enjoyed the rest he gave them? Isn't it so? Let us pray. Thank you, Father, for your word. May the Holy Spirit bless it to our hearts by enabling us to hear what you would say to us. Bless these saints of God who are here in this hall and those who hear this message and bless those who are unsaved, Father, that each and every one of them might 
somehow by the miracle of your Holy Spirit have their hearts touched to, to hear this word. Precious rest you have given us. Thank you for it. And as we, we part company here at this hall, Father, we commit each and every one of these precious sheep into the hands of the Good Shepherd where they are right now. And we commend them to the word of his grace, which will build them up. We just pray that we all may be conscious of the reality of Jesus' presence wherever we are. Help us to settle down on his breast and enjoy him. Most of all, that he might enjoy us. We thank you for this in his precious name. Amen. God bless you.